Christ, suffering at the hands of Rome, because they believed in Christ alone. They died through Europe, especially Spain, for they saw all but Christ is vain. He suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin. Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand. The Roman popes rule the land. Those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy. We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie, with 50 million reasons why. Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man, salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening. Welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name's Tom Press, and I'm here as guest host on Walt's program to continue the reading and discussion of this most magnificent Protestant work entitled Romanism and the Reformation from the Standpoint of Prophecy by uh, Henry Grattan Guinness. And last time we got together, two weeks ago, uh, we concluded on page 318 in the online version from the University of Toronto. And as is my custom for continuity purposes, I will retreat a paragraph back to page 317 and begin our reading from there. And remember, we were talking about the scriptural foreview of the Protestant Reformation. Did you know that the Protestant Reformation was was previsaged in the Scripture, foretold in the Scripture? And how do we know that the Protestant Reformation was predicted, or uh, its foreview was exposed in the Scripture? Simply by the history of Israel. Literally, we can use the history of Israel as a type of the Protestant archetype. Strange as it may sound, history is repeating itself. First through Israel, and now through the body of Christ, the Protestant Reformation. And all of the idolatry and sins into which God's people, the Jews, fell. Likewise, Protestantism has experienced those same fallacies. And likewise, is being chastened of the Lord. And if you'll listen carefully to the analogies in the Old Testament of the history of Israel, you will see, as I do, and as Henry Grattan Guinness does, a foretaste of the Protestant Reformation. Now, he begins in the middle of the page, 317, if you're following along. Henry Grattan Guinness says, The relapse of Israel and Judah into heathen idol worship was punished in the providence of God by their captivity in the lands of the heathen. Israel was carried captive into Assyria and Judah into Babylon. The heathenism of Jerusalem and of Babylon were substantially the same. Now let me just stop right here and comment. We've all heard that this final apostate church, which we have positively 
and irrevocably identified as the Roman Catholic Church is named in the scripture, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, <clears throat> excuse me, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, Jerusalem, Judah, and Israel fell into the same Babylonish worship way back in, the, in their day. And they forsook the law of the Lord. They forsook the proper worship of Jehovah, the God of creation. And they mixed with it Babylonish worship, heathenism, idolatry. And God punished them. And we can learn from the example of Israel and Judah what not to do in our day. And we find in careful examination of Christianity as it exists today, the same heathenist mixing of, of, of idolatrous Babylonish type worship with the worship of Jehovah. Now it says, the heathenism of Jerusalem and of Babylon were substantially the same. You have to ask a question. How, how, how was the worship of Jerusalem similar to that of Babylon? Well, simply because they had forsaken God's laws and commandments. And they began to erect images and idols and bow down and worship images and idols, mixing the holy with the profane. And God won't have it. Again, he says the heathenism of Jerusalem and of Babylon were substantially the same. Each was marked by gross idolatry and accompanied by the cruel persecution of all who resisted it. Man Manasseh filled Jerusalem with the blood of the faithful whom he slew. So there was open religious persecution by the king of the country, Jerusalem, Israel, against those who held fast to the true and pristine worship of Jehovah and would not bow down to images and idols and would not partake in these heathen rituals and heathen holidays and ceremonies. Again, we need to examine closely what the error of the house of Judah and Israel were so that we do not commit the same error. And in close examination, you'll find out that Christianity has indeed committed the self-same errors that, that Israel and Judah committed. He says, in Babylon, however, both idolatry and persecution found their most complete development. Nebuchadnezzar set up his golden image, issued his persecuting edict. In other words, if you don't bow down and worship this image, you'll be cast into the fiery flames, right? Nebuchadnezzar set up his golden image, issued his persecuting edict, and kindled his fiery furnace. And Belshazzar, which was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson who succeeded him in ruling Babylon, it says, and Belshazzar made his impious feast, his impious feast, and brought the vessels of God's house, those vessels that were used in the temple in Jerusalem in the service of God there on the temple, brought the golden vessels of God's house to his table that he and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink wine in them and praise the, quote, gods of silver and of gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, unquote. And Daniel said, addressing the doomed man, Belshazzar, quote, The God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified, unquote. 
So Neb- uh, Belshazzar gave glory to the gods of gold and silver and brass and iron and wood and stone, which are not gods. They cannot see. They cannot hear. They cannot know. And they cannot even go about from place to place. They're inanimate objects. And yet the God of glory, the God that hears and answers prayer, the God that created all heaven and earth, the God that created man, every man, was not glorified by Belshazzar. This is included in Daniel chapter 5, verse 23. Now, Jeremiah cries concerning Babylon, quote, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will do judgment upon your graven images, unquote. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 52. Another quote, A drought is upon her waters, and they shall be dried up, for it is the land of graven images, and they are mad upon their idols, unquote. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 38. Now, clearly, we are talking about man-made images and idols, which are specifically forbidden in the second commandment. The Babylonian worship of the, of, uh, uh, of, of the heathens, the Babylonish worship, which got its origin in Babylon, is practiced by every heathen religion on the planet. Image worship, idol worship, making and and worshiping images and idols. Okay, and where so is this more prevalent today than in the Roman Catholic Church? And it's called Christianity. Now this is the mark, the 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 mark, the the characteristic mark of the Roman Catholic Church idolatry. Anywhere you see idolatry in the world, the bowing down and worshiping of man-made images and idols, inanimate, lifeless statues and such like, is the Babylonian worship. And that is what God forbid, and yet that is what Israel practiced. Are you seeing the likeness of Jerusalem's error and that which is called Christianity today. Literally, the Old Testaments are setting forward through the example of Israel what will happen in the Gentile world in the second half of the era, of, of, of uh, in the Christian era. Now, he continues, he says, The climax of apostasy and rebellion was reached at last, and when Judah had practically sunk to the level of idolatrous Babylon, God suffered her or made her to be conquered and carried away captive by one Babylonian tyrant after another, and even his own temple at Jerusalem, which had been so desecrated and profaned by this Babylonish worship, he permitted to be captured and burned. God even allowed his own temple, which had been polluted by the worship of the, uh, of the, of the Israelites, of these Babylonish gods, these images and idols, God even permitted that temple to be destroyed, his own temple. So God will not have any part with imagery and idolatry and any such like thing. God will not have any part in any Babylonish type ceremony or ritual or holiday. And I'm just going to stop to tell you the three most precious holidays in the modern Christian era are Babylonish in origin. And I'm going to tell you what they are. This may cause the listeners to tune out at this point, but I, I, I must stand for the truth no matter what it costs. I would rather stand alone in righteousness than be a hero and popular and a name to be 
named among the heathen. Those three holidays in Christianity today, whose roots are strictly and solely in Babylon, are Sunday worship, Christmas, and Easter. Now, for those of you who have not just dismissed me as a kook and who seriously are searching for the truth, I beg you all to, to make yourself investigate this for yourself. Simply do as I did. Go to any reliable search engine and type in the origins of Christmas and read what it says. And you'll, meet, you'll read websites of many of the mainstream Protestant churches today, openly admitting that there is absolutely nothing Christian about Christmas. Sunday was never the Sabbath of God Almighty. It was the seventh day of the week. And it was never changed by God. Only God can change the Sabbath. And he never did. There's no record of it anywhere in the Scripture. There's no, e- there's not even an inkling that God would change His Sabbath. It remains today as it was in the Garden of Eden before there was a Jew or a Gentile. A day of rest for all mankind throughout all their generations. And if God had somehow changed the Sabbath, he would have defied his own language on the seventh day of creation. Now, God made the Sabbath holy. Now, how could God make the Sabbath holy? Simply because he is holy, and only he is holy. And if God makes something holy, man cannot do anything but pollute it. Okay, you neither obey or they can pollute, but they cannot change the day. And you'll find that in 321 AD, this is a matter of public record, still extant, that in 321 AD, the emperor of Rome changed the solemnity of Sabbath from the seventh day to Sunday the day that was always venerated by the Babylonish and heathen nations around Israel. And after all, it was sun worshipers who venerated the sun day, the venerable day of the sun, the invincible uh, sola invictus, they called it. It was the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the worshipers of Baal who at the height of, of, of the strength of the sun, at, at noonday, being challenged by uh, uh, Elijah, began to cut themselves, expecting their solar deity to consume the sacrifice. It was the priests of Baal that worshipped on the Sola Invictus, the day of the sun. Sunday, we call it today. And of course, there was no Sabbath at all to Isaiah, or rather to Jeremiah, uh, to uh, Elijah. And of course, the sun is no God at all. It, it's simply the, the man-made God of, of the heathen world. And it says, even more significantly during that passage, it was about the time of the evening oblation when the sun was not in its strength at high noon, but when it was setting, that God, the God of creation, the God of the Bible, the God of Isaiah, the God of Jeremiah, the God of Daniel, the God of Tom Fress, consumed the sacrifice and licked up the water and even licked up the altar proving that he was the God of all gods. But the heathen world has always and forever and has never repented of its worship of the sun deity, marked by solar invictus, the invincible day of the sun. 
And we mark it on the calendar as Sunday, the first day of the week. This was never God's Sabbath. It's never to be God's Sabbath. It is not God's Sabbath. It is not holy because only God can make something holy for only he is holy. And God never changes that which proceedeth out of his mouth. Sunday is not Sabbath. I don't know what it is, but it is not Sabbath. Can we worship on Sabbath or on Sunday? Rather, the day of the sun? We worship God every day. But there is one day set aside, the seventh day, which is a day of rest. And we are to keep it holy the way God intended for it to be holy. And every single time Jerusalem, the Jews, the Israelites began to worship or, or, or to pick up veneration of this pagan solar deity and hold the Sunday as holy, equal with the Sabbath of God, God punished them. If you're going to worship like the, the Assyrians, if you're going to worship like the Babylonians, then you get out of my land, you get out of my temple, and you go to Babylon, and you go to Assyria, and do that abomination where it belongs. And only after you've had enough of your idolatry and your false gods and your false Sabbath and your false worship and you've repented of it, then I'll bring you back to the land and I'll restore my law, my Sabbath, and you'll obey me. See, the most pristine form of worship of God Almighty is to obey him. All else is just instruction. But we are never to obey The heathen, we are not to follow a multitude to do evil. And Israel and Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord and mixed the holy with the profane. They worshiped God in the traditions of the Babylonian god Baal, the sun god. They did likewise the Syrian god. And God punished them reliably, incessantly, and forever punished Jews, the Jews, and the Israelites every time they fell into this apostasy. And what do we see in the Christian world today? The exact same idolatry as committed by Israel and Judah. So the examples clearly in the Old Testament of Israel's incessant insistence upon worshiping like the heathen was always punished by God, righteously punished by God, and the same punishment is due Christianity today. The bowing down and worshiping of images and idols, the veneration of a Sabbath other than the one God established, which is only holy, the only one that's holy, the seventh day, and then the keeping of holidays and festivities according to Babylonish tradition, which is Christmas and Easter. And if you, if, you, if you reject what I'm saying, simply have the courage to visit any reliable search engine and type in the origins of Christmas or the origins of Easter and see it for yourself. The mainstream Protestant uh, leaders of the world admit that Christmas is rooted in paganism which can be traced all the way back to Babylon. It was condemned in Jeremiah chapter 10. And likewise, Easter can find its roots nowhere else but Babylon. This is Babylon, mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And let us not continue to corrupt the pure worship of God by observing Babylonish traditions. Jesus said full well you reject the commandments of God by keeping your own, or rather, Babylonish traditions. The Bible makes it perfectly clear it was Israel who kept Babylonish and Assyrian traditions and mixed them with the pristine worship of God. Thou shalt not mix the holy with the profane. 
God will not share his throne with another which is not a God. And you would think that after 6,000 years, man would finally obey God. But here we are in the Christian era, after the complete canon of Scripture had been accomplished, after all the history of Israel, which each and every one of us can read at our leisure out of our Bibles, seeing for ourselves the very errors that Israel committed, here we are 2,000 years after the crucifixion of Christ, when our knowledge should be perfect, our understanding should be perfect, and here we are committing the same sins, the exact same sins as Israel and Judah. And Israel's history is simply a foreshadowing of what is going to happen in the, in the Christian era. Now he says... The climax of apostasy and rebellion was reached at last. And when Judah had practically sunk to the level of idolatrous Babylon, God suffered her to be conquered and carried captive by one Babylonian tyrant after another and his own temple at Jerusalem, which had been so desecrated and profaned, he permitted to be captured and burned. Okay. So what's the equivalent for our generation? It says the visible existence of the Jewish nation ceased for a time. The daughters of Jerusalem hung their harps upon the willows by the rivers of Babylon, and Judah lay desolate. That's what happens when God's people say God's law is dead and do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And that is exactly the state of Christianity today. And for that very reason, Judea lay desolate. Now, if God says, as he says repeatedly, that he is no respecter of persons, we can only conclude that if we committed the same sins as Israel and Judah, then God must punish us or desecrate his own name. And that's what's going to happen if we don't repent. Now, God sent prophets to warn Israel and Judah, repeatedly warning Israel and Judah what would befall them if they did not repent of their idolatry and heathen practices and return to the pristine law of God, the pristine worship of God, that he would send them into Babylonian and Assyrian captivity, and that's just exactly what's happened. Now, whose traditions are we observing today? Babylonish. And who is the current Babylon in the world? the Roman Catholic Church. And what we are going to see in this once Protestant land, since we have allowed Roman Catholicism to corrupt the pristine worship of God in the Protestant churches and have joined the ecumenical movement to unite back under the authority of the papacy, then we will be made slaves, captives of this new Roman system that has been literally brought to fruition on the backs of apostate Protestants. So if we do not repent of the ecumenical movement, if we do not repent of our idolatrous ways, our Babylonish ways, our traditions and holidays, then we will be made slaves of this Babylonish government in Washington, D.C., controlled by the priests and the bishops and the Jesuits of Rome. And I'm going to tell you ahead of time what that's going to be like. It's going to be just like the worship, uh, uh, just like life in Babylon. We are going to be forced by law, by decree of the king, our equivalent, Nebuchadnezzar, to bow down and worship images and idols against our consciences, against the written word of God. 
or be killed. That's what's going to happen. Or God owes Israel an apology. God owes Judah an apology. And he has disrespected his own name. He's a respecter of persons. We've left God no option. We've been given example after example after example in the history of Israel and Judah what not to do to provoke God to wrath. Yet we have done the same, exact same abominations. And the result will be the same. For God is not holy. That's just a hideous reality. And I can tell you from years and years of experience of preaching this to people who call themselves Christians, there doesn't seem to be any sentiment among them to repent of any of these things. Yes, we will continue to venerate Sunday. We will continue to, to, to keep holy Christmas and Easter. And you can just shuffle off the buffalo, Tom Press. And even I've suffered death threats for revealing the apostasy of modern-day Christianity. Repeated death threats, none of which have been carried out, but they've gone a long way toward it. And I won't enumerate it, but friends who are close to me know what they've accomplished against me. And I'm not the only one these days. I used to think I was the only one, but I'm by far not the only one decrying the apostasy of modern-day Christianity, which seems to be called nothing but Babylonian. And here we have Henry Gretton Guinness warning us, warning us, warning us what could be expected in our generation if we follow the sins, repeat the sins of Israel and Judah. Okay? The climax of the apostasy and rebellion was reached at last. I've read that already. It says the visible existence of the Jewish nation ceased for a time. What would be the equivalent of that today? Well, Protestantism ceased to exist in America for a time. Because we'd be under Babylonian rule. Okay? Protestantism is going to be legal, uh, illegal in this country. And he says, the daughters of Jerusalem hung their harps upon the willows by the rivers of Babylon. And that is, they were taken captive to Babylon. And Judah, where they left, lay desolate. There was no one there. And the temple was burned. Nothing left. Nothing left of what was known as Judah. Nothing left. What's the equivalent of that in our generation? Protestantism. Nothing is left. Rome has every intention to eliminate each and every one of us to the last man. Now he says, then about 500 years before the first advent of Christ, there came suddenly and unexpectedly deliverance and restoration. Ezra and Nehemiah were raised up to lead back and reorganize, reorganize in the land a remnant of the people, just a remnant, a small part of Judah. And it says, the temple of God rose from its ashes once more on Mount Moriah. Jerusalem was rebuilt and its civil and religious polity restored. In other words, the government and the priesthood and temple worship were restored. It was surrounded with walls and towers. The long-forgotten word of God was recovered and read in the audience of the people. And as the language had become somewhat obsolete during the 70 years of Babylonish captivity, the Jewish reformers, isn't that a wonderful selection of words? It says the Jewish reformers 
the equivalent of our Protestant reformers, the Jewish reformers, we are told, not only read in the book, in the law of God distinctly, but they also gave the sense and caused them to be understood from the reading. In other words, they did not just read God's holy law, but they explained it in its sense so that the people, the lowest of the people, the simplest of the people, could understand the meaning of the words. This is recorded in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. The restoration from Babylon inaugurated a blessed era of civil and religious liberty. The restored remnant were not without severe trials. It was by no means easy for them to accomplish their task in face of the persistent and successful opposition of Sanballat and the Honorite and his confederates and companies. But again and again, the work had to cease, and the people would have given up in despair, except for the, the encouraging and stimulating words of the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and other prophets. The joint ministry of Ezra and Nehemiah seems to have lasted about a half a century, and they were permitted to see the work accomplished. The Jewish people liberated from their long exile and better still, from all tendency to heathenism and idolatry. You see, we are going through a period of cleansing in these here Protestant United States. At this time, Protestantism seems not to exist at all. But God is selecting out of them a remnant to bring them to perfection, to bring them to the kingdom of Christ. Now, what you now you might argue with me and say that no, 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 Protestantism is is visibly existent in the United States of America. Let me define Protestantism for you. Protestantism is a protest. That's why they call it Protestantism. Protestantism. Let me ask you the question: You who call yourselves Protestants, Protestants, who do you protest? Who do you protest? I don't hear any protest. I don't hear any Protestant protest in the mainstream media. I hear almost none in the alternative media. I hear none, absolutely none, on amateur radio. And I listen to Christians who talk across this country from border to border and from, from, from coast to coast. And in seven to 10 years of discussion about Protestantism on amateur radio, I have yet to meet one single Protestant. Oh, there are multitudes who profess Protestantism, but when asked, what is Protestantism? What do you protest? They don't have an answer. And yet, Protestant literature exists all over this country the writings of the Protestant reformers, still extant, available on the Internet, available in libraries, books that are never read, tell you who the Protestant reformers protested. They protested the Antichrist of Scripture. That's right. They protested the Antichrist of history, the papacy throughout all its history, they protested. From the first century Christians, long before the rise of the papacy, they protested the papacy. Henry Grattan Guinness has made that perfectly clear. They protested the papacy by the prayer that they collectively said that they got together and prayed in unison for the longevity of the pagan Roman Caesars because they knew that that power which replaced the Caesars would be the man of sin, the son of perdition, that wicked, that thinks to change God's times and laws, that persecutes the saints, that is guilty of the blood of the saints of the martyrs of Jesus, 
that little horn with eyes like the eyes of a man and mouth speaking great things and blasphemies against the Most High. The papacy. Even the first century Christians, two centuries before the rise of the Roman papacy, protested it before it was even born. And every Bible-believing body of believers throughout history Throughout history, God has always had his witnesses protested the papacy, the Antichrist of the Bible. And the Protestant Reformation was literally defined by that protest against the Roman pontiff. And yet, I have yet, in all the years on amateur radio, to find one American who calls himself a Protestant that can even define it for me. So for all intents and purposes, outwardly, the Protestant Reformation is dead. It doesn't exist. One here and one there. So few and far between, they rarely even make contact with one another to share their faith. Completely lacking in fellowship. They stand alone. They worship God alone because they don't have any brothers and sisters with whom they agree. While the whole Christian world waits for a future Antichrist, these people protest the historic, the biblical, and the prophetic Antichrist, the popes of Rome. And when they do, and when they do it in earshot of any of these other so-called Protestants who are waiting for a future Antichrist, they are persecuted beyond comprehension. And I've experienced it myself. So there is visibly in the United States no believers left. No protestants left. But God is calling out a remnant because he's ready to do a quick work. And that is to destroy all those that know not God and who have been deceived by the Antichrist. He says, they never fell back into that sin after the return from Babylon. The long-suspended worship of God was restored. Magistrates, judges, and teachers of the law were appointed over the land. The people entered into a solemn covenant to separate themselves from all idolaters, and even, painful as it was, from the heathen wives some of them had taken. And before Ezra and Nehemiah passed to their rest, The people, the worship, the temple, and the city were all restored, and the canon of the Old Testament Scripture was arranged and closed. Many political and military troubles arose afterwards, but no such overthrow and restoration. It was to that second temple that Jesus Christ came, thus making the glory of the latter house greater than that of the former. Need I interpret all these true and yet typical history? Does it not apply itself to the latter antitypical history? Let me make it in plain language. Henry Grattan Guinness is asking me, do I need to interpret this for you? Do I need to explain exactly what the Jews did to accomplish their captivity in Babylon? Must I even explain to you that the same thing will happen in this our day if we fall into the same apostasy and idolatry? And yet he uses the terms typical and anti-typical meaning that Israel was the type of the archetype Protestantism. History is repeating itself. 
Israel in our generation is the body of Christ, true Bible-believing Protestants, who would never mix the holy with the profane, who would never bow down and worship images and idols, who would renounce any pagan Sabbath and cast aside all the traditions and feasts and festivals of the Babylonish church in Rome. And yet, if we fail and we do these things, we can consider Jerusalem and Israel, Israel and Judah, to be simply types of the eventual Protestant archetype. Again, he says, need I interpret all this true and yet typical history? Does it not apply itself to the latter the latter antitypical history? Have you not seen the Reformation of the 16th century as I have described? The return from Babylon? What's he saying here? Have you not seen the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century as our deliverance from Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church? The Protestant Reformation was our delivery from Babylon. And yet we've sunk back into Babylonian captivity. That's the evidence that's in the world in the Christian church today. It's wholly Babylonian. All its traditions, its Sabbath, its it's forsaking of the law. How many times have you heard in your so-called Christian life, well, the law is dead, crucified with Christ? You realize those people have forsaken God's law, failing to make the distinction between God's eternal, immutable, and holy moral law written on tablets of stone, not once but twice by the very finger of God Almighty? They failed to make a distinction between that and the law of animal sacrifices, which was fulfilled by Christ and put away by Christ. It was Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, speaking of Jesus Christ, who said, And he, Christ, shall cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. When Jesus became the sacrifice on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem during his crucifixion, there was to be no more sacrifice for sin. And yet, here we see in the Christian world today all hope of Israel's return. Jews to the land they call Israel, the rebuilding of a temple, and animal sacrifices being made. And don't you know the Pope is just dying for an opportunity? to offer his unholy sacrifice, the Eucharist, on that same mountain. And a whole Christian world that calls itself Protestant is rooting for both of them. There cannot be a greater darkness and blindness in God's house than there is in this hope of Israel to begin animal sacrifices again. And while they are hoping for a system to be erected on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem that will never be acknowledged by God, so that the Jews and Catholics and so-called Christians, ecumenical evangelical bellies around the world, can eat and drink damnation to themselves, out of the other side of their mouths they say God's law, the moral law, the eternal, immutable, and holy law of God is done away with. And they literally, by saying that, make Christ the minister of unrighteousness. You can't reject the truth more than it is rejected in Christianity today. There's no greater apostasy can be achieved in Christianity today to say that the Jews need to return to the land and make animal sacrifices just like the Catholics and God's moral law is dead. We're not under the law anymore. We're under grace. Just plead the blood. 
ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. Jesus is just like a bubblegum machine. You lust after a woman, you commit adultery, just ka-ching, plead the blood, and next week do the same thing. You make Christ the minister of unrighteousness, and he won't tolerate it. He won't tolerate it. Obedience is the only form of worship that God of heaven and earth will accept. It's holy and it's pristine, but it is completely rejected in what is known as Protestantism today. He says, have you not seen the reformation of the 16th century as I have described the return from Babylon? Is not Jerusalem the true church and Babylon the false? And is not Babylon Rome? He's absolutely right. It is Rome. And to the degree that Protestantism has taken on the image and likeness of her whorish Romish mother, she too is Babylon. She too is Rome. And the people who think that I am rude and crude and impolite and unchristian-like when I describe these apostate Romish Protestants as ecumenical evangelicals, you simply have not yet you simply have not yet comprehended the extent of their apostasy and rejection of the Christ they claim to serve. And I've got a few members that I've been associated with for a number of years now. They've done their own research. They've done their own research in history. They've done their own research in, pro, in, in, in prophecy. They've done their own research in the scriptures. And they come to me and say, Tom, I used to think that it was counterproductive to represent these people as ecumenical evangelical bellies. But I'm here to tell you today that I not only agree with you, I think you went out, I think you went easy on them. Well, whether or not I've been easy or hard makes no difference. What matters is what God's going to do to them, what God is going to call them. And for their, for them, I, I, I fret, I worry. They'll get over the name calling from Tom Press, okay? I mean, for most, it just runs off their back like water off a duck's back. Name calling. Oh, ecumenical evangelical belly. Isn't that cute? Doesn't mean anything to them. They are stiff necked people set in their ways against the God of glory, against the God who bled and died for them and returning to that wicked son of perdition in Rome. And what do I care what they think of me? Ecumenical evangelical belly does not describe these people. Daughters of the harlot, that's what they are. They've come of age. These young daughters that came from betwixt the knees of their Romish harlot mother in Rome have now aged and come to their middle age spread. And you know what? They look in the mirror and what do they see? Their mama. God calls them not ecumenical evangelical bellies. Now that's being too kind. God calls them the daughters of the harlot. So you can cast me aside as rude and crude, but watch out, because God calls them something even worse. 
All I have is words to chastise, to chasten, to admonish and correct. But the God of glory is a stone that grinds to powder and blows away with the wind. Henry Grant and Guinness is plainly telling us we've gone the way of Babylon. The Protestant Reformation was the deliverance from Babylon, but in our generation, after coming of age, we've turned into the harlot's daughters. Spitting images of our Romish mother. It's a hideous reality. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross, this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt, so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, Without our Savior, we're total lost.